Merlin Show. It is your Thursday edition, getting near the tail end of the week. One more day left of the first trading week of January. And as we talked about in yesterday's show, and that Santa Claus rally, who is ever so slightly a Santa Claus rally. And according to the Trader's Almanac, that means January should be pretty good. Now, that was not the case today, which we'll probably start off there looking at uh, our markets overall with a little bit of a market up. As why don't we just do the graphics that Tim paid for, or I paid for Tim, the Trader Merlin market update. So, We'll start things off today uh, going over just what happened out in the marketplace. Certainly not shaping up to be a great January with the moves we had today in most of the major market indexes. Of course, you did have some energy looking really good. So let's dive in there and then we'll go back to the topic of joy, which is really all about you. So I'm doing an open Q&A going back to a bunch of listener questions that uh, I've not had a chance to answer and hopefully get all those out of the way. So if you have something, type it on in. Let's get uh, the questions in. Jimmy says... Rainy day, snow at Tahoe, yes. Tahoe, Big Bear, we're getting trounced on down here as well in Southern California. So good to see the rain, but unfortunately a lot of damage being done to oh, power lines and landslides and floods, but uh, we'll take it. We need it down here. All right, let's start at the bottom, work our way up. Uh, NASDAQ 100 is the one, the topic du jour, at least the worst performer. Uh, and by the way, I didn't give you guys the update yesterday. Uh, that options trade that I had on the NASDAQ 100, remember I told you I did the Santa Claus rally I screwed up this year. I don't know why. I did it on the NASDAQ. Next year, I promise I will do it on the S&P 500, which it's supposed to be on. But I did the Santa Claus rally purchase on December 23rd, sold out um, yesterday. It was a 0.6% gain. So I ended up making just a, a hundred bucks or so. No big deal on that trade, uh, but better than losing a bunch of money. So that was the first one. Next year, we'll do. I'll go even bigger and I'll do it on the S&P because... Santa Claus rally seems to work, although it was interesting overall for the Santa Claus rally, it was like a 1.03% gain, but we had days that were like 2% up, 2% down, so at the end of it, you had a nice swing trade going on, but man, there was some great intraday activity. All right, let's start off at the bottom here because it's a fairly ominous picture. We talk so much on this program about the trend is your friend till the bend at the end, and if we look at this chart right here, you know, it has been making consistently lower lower lows and consistently lower highs. We can put on pretty much whatever moving average you guys want. I know some people love moving averages. So uh, here, I'll just add on. What do I, I don't even know what I have on here. This is the, I know what period moving average I have here. This is the 200, but let's go shorter term. Let's do, the, the, let's do a 50, all right? You're going to be below everything on the 50 as well. Uh, simply because we had that uh, sideways action over here. We crossed above it, but we're still trending down on that. If you look at the chart pattern though, to me, it, it's really forming a descending triangle. You can see this base on the NASDAQ 100 right around 10,642, but the highs are getting lower and lower and lower, and this is not a really good sign. If that does end up breaking, you know, that could be a significant downside move for the market. So we'll see if we get below that 10,642 over the next few days. Kinda don't want it to, but uh, either way, we'll make trades and hopefully capitalize on it. So that is your worst performer down 1.48%. Nipping on the heels of that one, you have the Russell 2000, which looks better. Notice the way the, the price action has been looking. We are still making lower highs, but we are also making higher lows. And I'll try to, usually at the end of the year, I delete all my lines. So what I'll do is if we go through these charts, I will delete all lines um, and then we'll build out new ones for the new year. So this one's looking much better than NASDAQ. NASDAQ showing more weakness because it's nearing those lows, whereas the Russell feels like it's really consolidating. And maybe Tom Barr, if he's here today, will uh, jump on some spread trades here and just play the range. Let's just do this. Let's go and grab the little yellow box. Since I haven't done yellow boxes for quite some time, let's do that. I'm just going to do the, uh, the larger box. Certainly, we could focus on the one that's in the inside here and go a little bit tighter, but let's start with that bigger box and see how this goes forward for the Russell 2000. Certainly, uh, if we get in that you know, 1820 mark, well, you're kind of dead middle of the range. Let's do some spread trades on that one. Uh, gold. I'm still very bullish on gold. I do think you'll see that 2000 price target hit this year. Uh, right now at 1838, a decline of 1.12%. It wasn't just gold. You can look at SLV as well. Um, as silver was down about 2.2% today. So it's been ugly day for commodities, specifically um, natural gas. We'll look at that in just a second. UNG and gas were just getting slaughtered. But let's run through these top seven markets so I can go over to our listener questions. Uh, S&P 500 was your one of your better performers, down 1.09% on the day. I've, I've got these lines drawn. I guess I can leave those ones because they still are in play, in my opinion. 
So similar to what we saw with the Russell 2000, which is forming a little bit of compression, kind of like a spring being pushed together. I know we have some new people out there, so for those of you who are new, uh, hit that subscribe button and uh, like if you like the show. But you know, when you look at the way that those price action's looking there, let's see if I can do this. I think I can do host with one. Um, if you look at the way that price action has been compressing as we go forward, ooh, maybe I can even use this new one. Uh, let's see. I might be able to do, I've been playing around with different camera angles. So if you notice the way that this is, oh, it's going to cut me off. But the way that this has been getting, where is it? There, lower lows. But as we get closer, yeah, it's not going to work that way. I, I was trying to be cool and do some cool stuff, but it didn't happen. Uh, but as we get closer to that compression, think of it like taking a spring in your fingers. Uh, if you want to follow along, it's pretty easy. You just open up a pen, you go in there, and you grab the spring out, which is right there. And you can take that spring and you squeeze it and squeeze it. Ultimately, it's going to shoot out in one direction or another. Normally, it's in the direction of the prevailing trend. I know. I'm, I'm messing up with the show today. Uh, but normally, it's going to go in the direction of the prevailing trend. In this case, as you can see on that price chart there, what's the prevailing trend? Well, actually, it's, it's down. So it would, it would imply that this is most likely going to break to the south side here. But... You know, we could see this compress even more. That's why I have this top line drawn, which connects the, the peak that we have, which is actually slightly off. Let me, let me make this trend line precisely where it should be. For some reason, it's not, but we'll go to the peak there. And I think that that should do it. So we run through that point, we run through that point, we run through this point. I think it can be tucked a little bit, pretty much like that, right? We did tiptoe above it, that's okay. Uh, but I do see compression here on the S&P 500. So that's all in all, uh, not a great sign for anybody looking for trends because it could continue to compress there. But once it does break out, you should get a really nice move. Uh, up or down doesn't particularly matter to the active trader. Odds are it will be to the downside just because of statistical probability. All right, here's your Dow, which is the outlier. When we look at our four indexes, it looks nothing like the other three because it's not near the lows. Actually showed some pretty nice rally up. And again, I think that the we talked about this at the end of last year. You know, why did the Dow perform so well over the past, you know, month of October, November, and into December? It's because predominantly it's the big blue chip stocks, it's consumer staples, you know, it's not a lot of tech heavy pieces, which really are the ones that brought it down. You know, you look at what happened. There's your Apple chart. Uh, Apple, I do believe now, is officially the second company to lose a trillion dollars worth of market capitalization. They are now under two trillion. They were at three trillion. Um, you had Amazon, right, which was down, has lost over a trillion dollars in market cap. So these are the ones that were really bringing down the NASDAQ, but these aren't heavy hitters in the um, Dow Jones Industrial Average. So it was spared there. Let's go up a little bit further, look at Bitcoin. Nothing really here to speak of. It is pretty much flatlined. If you look at this chart, really, really ugly. So I'll just jump that one real quick. And then today we had a bit of an about face. Obviously, the last two days for crude oil have been absolutely brutal. Big declines from over $80 down to around 73 or in the 72 range. Here we are now bouncing back up a little bit today. $1.08 bounce to 73 92 or 1.5%. Um, other notable pieces there were that dollar index, right? You did have... Two out of the last three days have been really big up moves for the dollar index, which, you know, I, I don't know what to make of this, honestly. Is this that bend at the end that's going to cause that dollar to surge and get back up towards that 115 yeah. high we saw a while back? Um, I don't think so. I, I think we might get a little bit of a bounce here and then ultimately um, kind of go range bound for a while. But we'll have to wait and see on that one. And then the last piece was going to be the bond markets. I thought I had those up here at the top. There's my 10-year. You had a 1% increase on the 10-year today, jumping at 3.72%. So again, feels like we're starting to see a little bit of consolidation here, which is nice. Calm before the storm. And for anybody who's doing sideways trades like Tom is, makes for a good opportunity. All right, uh, let's see. This is what I was going to get into to, to begin with, which is Trader Q&A. Uh, I was looking for a specific topic, but honestly, I have way too much going on in my, in my world and my brain right now, so I just couldn't think of something original for you. So I thought, you know what? I'll dive into listener questions and at least answer a few of those on today's show before I grab a glass of whiskey for the Friday show. Before we do that, let's start off with just some economic data that came out today. Kind of surprised to see this one. You know, we talked about the jobs report, and if you look at the, um, oh, it's a bunch of birds outside, crazy screaming noises. Uh, if you look at the Monday morning must knows I do for all my trading academy, you know, I address this. It's really the jobs week. There's so much jobs information. But as you can see here, you have the ADP non-farm employment change, which is job creation. They were actually expecting a contraction from 182,000 jobs 
to 152. So they were looking at a reduction of 30,000 jobs as far as non-farm employment change. Actually, instead of being negative 30K, we actually came out at positive, let's see, that's 35 plus 18 is gonna be 47, right? Uh, no, 43, 53. We had a 53 plus. So basically you're looking at an $83,000 83, job discrepancy between expectations and reality. Not too shabby. Uh, that's actually really good news. I, I kind of anticipated the market surging a little bit on that, but you know, look at the reaction. Here is the S&P 500. Bring up the ES. Look at it on a five-minute time frame, and the reaction to that from right from the onset is just bearish. Uh, it's it's bizarre when you think of hey, job creation. There was a ton of jobs created. That that in theory should be a very positive sign, right? Well, it just goes to show you that the market will do whatever it wants to do at any moment in time, and makes it. Sometimes very challenging for us. So that was your uh, economic calendar, your earnings calendar. You had a couple decent names out there. Um, you had Constellation Brands report earnings they missed. You also had Walgreens, Lamb Weston, ConAgra Brands, Helen of Troy, and Schnitzer Steel. A lot of those uh, beat earnings. As you can see there, Lamb Weston really just beating earnings significantly. And they uh, were up 9.77%. But, but look right above it, right? You had Lamb Weston had a 72% surprise on their earnings and price was up 9%. Walgreens Boots Alliance had a, you know, call it a 1% surprise in their earnings. So they were in line and you were down 6%. So I don't know. It just it goes to show you never know with earnings. None of these are really market movers. It's not until next week, as you guys may probably know this, uh, maybe I can just quiz you just because I do like when you guys get all kinds of responses in there. Um, what... What major event is happening next week that is, could potentially be a major market driver, right? There's, there's something happening next week that is, it's, yeah, I want to I wanna, just see if how much attention you guys play to the markets. But there's an event happening next week that is really like, all right, here we go. This is it. Amazon did cut 18,000 uh, 18, jobs, and you're seeing more. I think Salesforce cut some more jobs. Um, but this is going to be the new norm. You're going to see job cuts going on all over the place. And I think many of you in your... Um, in your jobs and your environment, I'm going to start to see layoffs happening, I think, more and more. Again, this was foreshadowed, was it not? We heard Jerome Powell say, expect pain, expect higher unemployment. And it's been coming slowly. We've talked about some of those companies that have been doing layoffs, but, you know, Amazon doing 18,000, that's pretty big. Salesforce as well. So next week, you do have CPI, which is a big one, which is a big one. But remember, we get, we get an inflationary number like every week, right? There, it seems like there's something. It's either PPI, CPI, or core PCE. So yes, that will be important. So congrats to those guys and gals that got the CPI number. But really, it boils down to Friday. Friday is the day of days with regards to earnings season. It used to be that Alcoa kicked off earnings season. And the reason I brought that up is, you know, you look here and you run through this list and you're like, oh, oh, what a boring day for earnings, right? It doesn't really seem like there's much going on. No real market movers. Well, next Friday, which I will bring up that calendar for you guys right now, just so we can take a peek. I'm, I'm jumping the gun here a little bit. So hold on one second. Here is the earnings calendar for next Friday. Bank of America, JP Morgan, United Health Group, Citigroup, Delta Airlines, Wells Fargo, BlackRock, Bank of New York Mellon, First Republic Bank. It's Financial Friday or F yeah Friday going on next week. So that will be the official kickoff to earnings season. And as we've seen, you know, financials, let's go XLF, they really have, there you go, your daily, they really haven't done much. I, I've been looking at this chart of financials and expecting there actually to be some follow through to the upside. I, I'm kind of of the belief that the higher yielding environments should bode well for financials, but we'll wait and see what those numbers come out as uh, on Friday. But expect the tail end of next week, particularly Friday and then the week after to be full of huge swings. In my experience, it always seems like earnings season starts off real strong with positive emotions in the marketplace. So if the financials start things off positive, you might see a rally for a week or so, but then it becomes desensitized and numb to those earnings announcements. Even when companies just blow out earnings, it seems to be like, ah, we already celebrated this. Let's move on to a different story. So keep your eye on that one. It will be um, an interesting one. Is it Was it 1%? I actually thought it was more than that. I thought it was higher than 1%, but you're probably right there, Tom. Um, still, it may, even if it's 1% or 2 or 5 or 6, it's still 18,000 jobs, and it's a sign from one of the biggest companies in the world that things are really starting to slow down. Um, hey, KF, I appreciate that. Uh, glad you enjoyed that session with Todd yesterday. So that's your... 
economic calendar and earnings calendar information. That said, I'm going to dive into, and none of those really were that interesting to me. I don't trade any of the companies that we see here. I just always feel like I should um, address these questions just so that you guys can uh, you know, address the earnings just so you can see them and, and be aware of them when they come out. Uh, let's see. Jimmy says, how do you expect AI to impact trading or will it be like institution trading? The institutions are the AI. Look, I really am not concerned with him. So if you think of the, on the grand scheme of things, what do you think your place is in the financial world? And you have to always put it in context and say, okay, how do I, how do I relate to this giant machine that is the financial markets? And the reality is, you and me, everybody in this room, you are so unbelievably insignificant that nobody even notices you're there. This is a positive thing, right? What you don't want to be is you don't want to be that big guy that everybody knows is there and is gunning for. I make the analogy that for those of us who are the shorter term traders, you know, maybe you're swinging a couple hundred thousand, you know, let's just say under a million dollars, you're like the guy in a Zodiac in a narrow canal. You can maneuver, you can switch directions, you can do whatever you want, real quick, flip, flip, flip. It's easy for you to maneuver uh, without really getting caught. And again, I say getting caught, that's having someone notice you. And of course, there are some factors that you have to pay attention to, things like uh, make sure that the one the, the securities you're trading are very liquid. If you're trading stuff that's illiquid, then yeah, you're, you're going to leave a footprint and people will start to identify you and exploit you. If you look at AI and think robots are going to take over and that's going to be the big problem, I'm not really worried about that at all because I'm so insignificant. I think I told you guys this story before. It's kind of funny. I was teaching over in Italy and I was sitting in my office writing on a uh, writing on my computer, doing some typing, and I, I just went to scratch my neck like this. And as I did that, this mosquito flew off my neck. Basically, he didn't really fly. He was so engrossed with blood. I've never seen one this big that he literally fell to my desk and he started bouncing, like trying to fly, but he was so fat. He'd been there for so long that he just couldn't fly anymore. And I'm like, okay, that's crazy. And I just, I just smashed him. And from that point on, I have this idea in my mindset that that's what my goal as a trader is. Whether your goal is this or not, it's defined, but mine is this. You have to approach it like you're a mosquito. A mosquito if, if all it needs is a little bit of blood to live, right, to survive. And if I can go into these markets, whether that's stocks or options or futures or Forex or cryptocurrencies, derivatives, whatever, and just get a little bit enough to meet my needs, then I can get in and out with nobody really noticing. Where we get caught is where you get greedy and stay on there too long, try to make too much, make too big of a play, and then that mosquito gets killed. I don't want to be that mosquito. So I know it's a horrible analogy, but I think many of you might be able to relate to that one as I'm the master of bad analogy. Hey, Big Ab, good to see you. Uh, Skill Talksman, um, Jeff Ski taking my $150 losses lately in metals, energy, S&P, just can't find a way to beat the chop. Yeah, no matter what futures. Um, I'm starting out. But maybe instead of uh, op futures, if it's chop, go to options, right? I had this conversation, that, that I think it was a conversation we had with Larry, you know, when if you think of Forex markets or futures, you really have to be right directionally. Whereas options, you don't have to be right directionally. If it goes sideways and does nothing, you're like, okay, cool, great. Tom says, big corporations can always cut 10%. Yep. And, and they could probably cut more. And you know, what's interesting is this came right after the holiday season. And you know that they did a massive amount of hiring for the holidays. So this, I don't know what the normal layoffs are. My assumption is there's probably a, a standard pattern of layoffs in January after the holiday rush. I know friends that went to work for Amazon and it was just for a part-time basis, just for the just for this, the Christmas rush. So probably not that big of a deal, but uh, a time for companies to clean house a little bit. And, and it's probably a good thing. If we look at Amazon, now, we, now you guys got me on different topics. That's perfect, I love it. If you look at Amazon's chart here, you know, I'm, I'm bullish on Amazon. I'm just not buying it yet. I mean, look at this price chart. It's still just not looking strong. Today's news, in theory, should help Amazon. Why? Well, because you're cutting, you know, let's say it's 1% of your workforce, you have 18,000 jobs, well, you're saving quite a bit of money. So normally that would act well for a company going forward, but in order to make that statement uh, definitively, I'd have to look and see what the historical pattern of layoffs are for Amazon going into the January, which I'm sure there's a regular flow. <laughs> Oh, no problem, Agent. Glad you're here. Welcome to the program. Hit subscribe and share it. Always, always great to have a little help in spreading the, 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 uh, the show here. All right, let me, um, I'm going to do something just a little bit different here. Obviously, I love answering listener questions. For those of you who might be new, send your questions. Basically, go to Trader Merlin's YouTube page, 
click on any video. You can put your comments down below that. What I do is I generally take those, put them into a PowerPoint deck and, and get to those as we progress. So this is one that came through to my email. You can email me at tradermaroon at gmail.com. Um, <laughs> thoughts on the Speaker of the House situation from Lisa. Now, at least I don't know if this was you that's in the chat here, but you guys know my stance on this stuff. I don't care about the Speaker of the House right? It, it's not going to impact me. Will it move the markets? It could potentially, but I really just don't care. I, I don't care who's the Speaker of the House. I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican. Just do their jobs. And right now, I don't feel like they're doing their jobs. It's on the 10th vote. So I guess in that sense, I do care. I think it's just annoying that we have to sit there and watch these guys bicker about who's going to do what. You got hired. You got paid by us as your taxpayers. Do your freaking job. That said, I don't really care who it is. Um, you know, I can anticipate that it might be this person or that person and maybe make a trade. But in reality, especially on this program, it's just about markets. And that's all I really care about. What I did think was interesting is I know many of you have been um, saying uh, that Nancy Pelosi, right? That Nancy Pelosi is the biggest scammer out there and she's all insider trading and she trades so much. I got this the other day and I thought this was really interesting. So what this is, um, is showing you the members of Congress that actually made money what their rates of return were for 2022. And does anybody see Nancy Pelosi on here? This is not a Democrat thing. It's not a Republican. Then look at the look at the, the red, obviously, is Republican, blues, Democrats. You know, Patrick Fallon had the greatest rate of return for a, um, a Congress member, 51.6%. Awesome. Susie Lee, uh, you know, and it's fairly even here, Democrats versus Republicans. It just drives me nuts when, you know, someone's like, oh, well, it's all Democrats are doing this. or it's They're both doing it. They're both scum. But down here near the bottom, she actually lost money. She did worse than the S&P 500 this year. She was down 19.8% apparently. Now, I don't know what her husband was at, but um, I thought you might find that interesting when you're at your next you know, dinner party or conversation. Somebody's like, oh, Nancy Pelosi is the best insider trader. Well, I think we could reassess that statement and look here and go, how about Patrick Fallon? Uh, or Debbie Schultz, you know, if you want to, if you're a Republican and want to hate the Democrats, well, it was Debbie Schultz was the bad one. Or if you're a Democrat and hate Republicans, oh, Patrick Fallon was, who cares, right? It, it is what it is. Just let him, let it, let it be and move on to something else. All right, let me uh, get away from the political stream before I start offending everybody here. <laughs> yeah, it's her husband who's up. Yeah, probably, right? She's feeding all that information out there. Okay, so this is an old question and I apologize, Les. Uh, I know that you, um, I know that you sent this one a while ago, and I apologize for not getting to it, but I will get to it right now. Les says, the shooting star candle by itself is not significant unless it's at, it is after a move up. But how much of an up move do we have to have to make the shooting star valid for trading? Is it after just one bullish candle or several, or does it have to move up a certain percentage? Well, you know, I think what's interesting with that one, Les, and it's a good question, is... I think you have to map rules around it for yourself. I don't have any specific, oh, it needs to move 5% or 2% or 1%. I don't do anything like that. But let me um, get my PowerPoint over here and I'll draw some drawing tools so I can draw a couple pictures of them. And then we will um, answer that question with a visual, which I think is probably the best way to answer that. So a new slide, <coughs> make it a clear one. Okay, so now I will draw something for you. I'll draw a few different things. So if you look at a shooting star, so those of you who might be, oops, uh, not the donkey of the day. We're going to go over here. <laughs> Conveniently, the donkey of the day. Uh, my cursor landed on that one. Sorry about that. All right. So if I go over here and I'll draw a uh, shooting star for people. Come on. There it is. Shooting star is where you have a long topping tail and you have a small real body, right? And essentially what you had was a period of time where price was up and looking rather bullish, and then all of a sudden came crashing down. You know, if you have price looking like this, where it's just traversing sideways and you have a um, that formation, I agree with you, it's insignificant. Now, if I have a situation where I'm looking at a, a nice uptrend and I get one like that, now I'm interested, right? I, I, this is really what I'm looking for in a daily. I have scans and filters where I'm looking for that type of setup. And of course, I'll put a line below the low. If it opens up up here anywhere and breaks down, great, I'll make that trade. That, that's, that's it. As far as is there a, a distance uh, requirement between here and that peak? You know, is there X amount of value? N not for me. I don't really look at that and say, hey, it has to move four, five, six percent, nothing like that. What I do like in conjunction with this. So let's draw a similar picture. If we have, you know, the, the upper left-hand corner one is just choppy market with the 
shooting star formation doesn't mean anything. An uptrend of the shooting star is great. We like this, but what can what could we use to make this better? Let me ask you guys that question. All right, if if I if we look at the example I've got drawn here, the one that I like, where I like this, um, you know, an uptrend shooting star. There's two things in particular that I'm going to be looking at that make me go, ooh, now I really like it. Right, I really like this formation. What is it? Um, does time frame matter? A uh, Glenn, great question. Uh, generally, generally with these. You like to start off with dailies because dailies will give you gap ups, right? You don't usually get gaps on an intraday. But if I saw a five minute shooting star, let's say market just opens up at 630 Pacific, rallies hard for an hour and a half and all of a sudden has a shooting star. Hey, could I trade that? Absolutely. The, the thing is, you're probably not going to get as big of a move as if you're trading it on a daily just because of scale. So you guys got it. John says supply zone. Yes, that's definitely one of them. And then believable direction says volume. Both of those. Are, are like odds enhancers for me, right? So if I have this setup, which is price rallying, got a nice trend, and it could be a super steep move or a nice just, you know, if it looks like this uptrend, ah, oh, I don't dab now with this stupid drawing tool. If it looks like that is an uptrend or like this is an uptrend, yeah, I mean, I I'm interested in both. I don't really have a preference, but what I wanna see is, let's use, uh, let's get rid of this one on the right-hand side, get rid of that, and let's say we got this uptrend, oh, yeah, yeah this uptrend here, and I got my shooting star. There, so there's your shooting star, and bam. If I look over here to the left, and I can see that, oh wow, it came into a supply zone. Let's just assume that this was an old supply zone over here, right? Just making it up as we go along. So we had a supply zone, it's sold off, and then makes this nice big uptrend. If I look back and I've got the supply zone over here, that makes me feel even better, because now I'm anticipating it's selling off. But if, if I'm using the supply zone, right? The problem here is, if I'm gonna trade the candlestick formation when it breaks this low, I've already left all of this money on the table. That's, that's lost money, but that's okay, right? I would much rather enter a trade having left money on the table, but having more confidence that it's actually moving in my direction. The other part here is, as uh, was said by Eric and um, Believable Direction, is volume. So if volume, oh, yeah, yeah. if volume looks like this, here's volume at the bottom, right? You have some little spikes, okay, looks great. And as it's trending up, you get higher volume. All of a sudden, you have a candle that looks like this. You know, we're talking double, triple, normal volume into supply and I have a shooting star. You know, this is where you throw your hands up in the air and you're like, oh, yes, this is it. Now, does it mean it's, it has to work? No, nothing does. But it's like if I had the spectrum of, of odds of probability and I just have a shooting star, whatever, 50-50, coin toss. If I have it in the example uh, that I just drew for you, we'll say uh, in the uptrend, and I have an uptrend with a shooting star, but no supply and no volume, I'll go 55, 45 in my favor. If I've got an uptrend into supply with the shooting star, now I'm looking like, I feel like I'm at a 60, 40. Now you add climactic volume, which usually indicates change. I feel like I'm at 70 or 75% in my favor, right? And those are all just subjective numbers in my head, just from my experience. But, you know, it's all about having, in this case, these would be, to some extent, odds enhancers, right? The supply zone is one piece. The shooting star is another piece. The trend is another piece. The volume is another piece. And, you know, you put all those things together. And I think that what it does is it removes a lot of the emotion from you as far as here's how I need to make a trade. Uh, keeps it rather simple. And there you go. And again, we could flip this whole thing upside down and make it a hammer formation, right? So Les, did I, did I answer your question? Fast move up on volume too. I mean, when you get a really fast move, the, the challenge there is I would much rather trade something that has a, a nice consistent trend versus a super big spike over two days because I don't know how much emotion is in that move, right? When you see something move 20 or 30% in just a couple of days, you, you gotta go, oh, wait a minute. Am I, is there something I don't know? But if something moves 20 or 30% over a month, it's like, okay, it's been building and building and building and building. If it happens very, very short period of time, not good. Exactly, agent. It, it's, it's, it's about making sure that if I am going to put my money, my hard-earned money on the line, that the odds are in my favor, right? I'm not going to go to Vegas and go, oh, sweet, roulette, putting everything on red or black. That's a sucker bet. Over time, you're going to lose money because it's a 49, I think it's 48% chance of winning in that situation, which means 52% of the time you'll lose in Vegas on that bet. Um, you know, in blackjack, I think your odds are 49% in your favor if you don't have a strategy. 
And so over time, you know, you'll end up losing money if you just play any really gambling game in Las Vegas. The whole point of it. Awesome, Les. Uh, so my question is, on a step like, on a setup like that, what would be your signal that this isn't going to work? Um, there's multiple things, but in the past, you know, I've mentioned with with my viewers quite a bit. Let me get some of this stuff out of the way here. Erase these. All right, so get rid of all that garbage. Um, what I love to look for, and it's just the simplicity of it is, I put a line right across the bottom, and I say, the next candle has to open anywhere above this line. Anywhere up here. So if it opens up here, I'm okay. If it opens there, I'm okay. If it opens here, I'm okay. If it opens down below it, I'm out. I'm not interested. And, and that's just my rule. That's just from my experience. That's how I trade them. You know, find what works for you. But if it, um, if it opened up right here, broke down, I'll go short right on that line. And hopefully I'll get some nice follow through from this move because initially what this candle tells you is that's where momentum is going. It's moving to the south side. Now, if it opens up down here and then rallies up, to me, that's, it's a dead trade. I, I don't, I'm not interested anymore. So that's, there's a lot of different reasons that could um, cancel or show me that it make me believe it's not going to work. But generally when it gaps down below there and rallies back up, I'll leave it alone. You know, if it opens up up here, so let's, let's go back just a second because I'm pretty sure this is going to be your question here, uh, Agent Sancho. You know, if it opens up up here and then has a day where it's got a nice big, you know, big green candle, okay, well, is the shooting star still in play? In my opinion, yes. Now, even though it's still in play, I'm still going to follow the same rules, it doesn't feel as strong. While it's still in play, it doesn't feel as strong. Why? Well, because if this candle right here, if the shooting star itself is reflecting negativity, if it's reflecting pain in the marketplace and you know the seller is winning this battle, then it should have continued on down. But it didn't here because we've got this green candle. So that, it, while it's still in play, it takes away a lot of the power and strength of it. So, you know, my probability on this one is going to decline significantly if I see something like that. So there you go. No problem. Great questions. I'm sorry for the, uh, the platform messing up on me and me scrolling to different pictures. Again, where's TJ? I need TJ. All right, next one from one of our regulars, Mr. Tom Barr. Tom says, do you know what amount of trades are transacted by retail, hedge fund management, uh, mutual fund managers, insurance companies, banks, etc.? Which ones really affect the market? Um, I don't. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really watch that stuff anymore. I used to. When I, when I was younger in my early days back in the late 90s, um, I would look for that and find out any information I could. Unfortunately, a lot of that is hidden. So a lot of the, the data you're going to see about mutual funds, about hedge fund management, um, insurance companies, banks... They're not, they're not forced to report on a monthly basis. It's going to be more quarterly. So by the time you get that information released, it's already going to be so lagging on what they did as far as accumulation or distribution of their portfolio. So I stopped looking at it. Now, as far as, as, far as you know, using that information and watching it and trying to make trades off it, well, I would say that your, your, biggest, fund, your biggest pieces here are probably going to be you know, hedge funds and mutual funds. You know, the guys are really swinging big positions. Uh, banks, yeah, sure, they are involved with it, but I would look at the hedge funds and mutual funds because they're trading millions of shares at a time. And to the astute eye, to somebody who really is a student of the price charts, you can see on level two uh, and on price charts kind of where institutions are unloading, right? By the behavior of transactions, using things like reserve orders and identifying, hey, this guy is only showing that he wants to sell a thousand shares, but I just watched him sell a million shares pretty sure price is going to be going down because they're, they've stopped it. So they're the ones that have the big sway. And that's really what, um, you know, one of the cornerstones of what OTA's content is about. It's saying, look, we've had floor traders from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, from the New York Stock Exchange, not really say the NASDAQ because it was all electronic, but order aggregators that would stack up orders and understand that when you have an abundance of buyer sell orders at any specific level, then generally prices are going to turn and go the opposite direction. What was it? Newton's law of motion. Um, something remains in motion until acted upon by an opposite but equal force, I believe is the is first law of motion, something like that. See you, John. Have a good one. So, you know, that one, you know, how do you know? How do you know that, that right now some big hedge funds unloading? Hard to tell, but you can see on price charts, which is kind of what my trading is based off of, is just the price action that goes on. So I would say I don't have any specific data, Tom, um, empirical, like here's a data set on how much mutual funds or insurance companies are trading, um, but they, they all impact the markets. 
the main difference here is when you look at your list of participants, you have banks, insurance companies, fund man mutual fund managers, hedge fund management, and retail. Only one of these, in my opinion, is acting off of headlines and news, right? Because it's the hedge funds, the mutual funds, the insurance companies, and the banks that make the news. <clears throat> That's the real big difference in why most retail traders fail, in my opinion, is because you have all these guys are creating the news, except retail. Retail is the one who's out there reading it and absorbing that news every day and making trades off it. So you be careful. You know, that's why I mentioned many times that number three on my list of 10 laws is ignore the news, but listen to every word of it. I feel like every action done by a mutual fund, a bank, a brokerage firm, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, you name it, is designed to influence you and sway you into an action. I don't know, some of you have probably seen these guys who are supposed to be uh, psychics, right? And they go on like a Jay Leno or, you know, so one of these shows and they'll go up there and be like, let me ask you some questions. You know, you with the, with the blue shirt, you know, how long have you been on, you know, doing this and that? And they ask all these questions and pretty soon they'll be like, I want you to take this piece of paper. This is just random. Take a piece of paper and I want you to draw a picture. And they do it to somebody else, you know, that's on the show. And all of a sudden, they both drew a, a picture of a, a rabbit eating a carrot. And they're like, how the hell did two people, a complete random, or three or four people, all draw a rabbit eating a carrot? And the reason it happens is because the guy who's supposed to be psychic is using keywords and phrases that will cause your brain to think of a rabbit and a carrot. And I think that the financial world is no different than that. It is about sheer manipulation, psychological warfare, where the people that stand to make the most, which are the big institutions, absolutely know that, and they are manipulating the data, the reports, and the information to get you to do something. So that's why retail traders are almost always wrong. Always wrong. All right, anyway, sorry, I went on a strange rant there. So, Tom, I apologize. I don't have the answer directly to your question, uh, but I definitely think that it's the big the big guys. Mutual funds and hedge funds are the ones that are really steering the market and having the biggest effect. That's where I can look at those price charts, you know, and I can look at this chart of, uh, I don't know. Look at this price chart right here. And look at this move right here that happened with Apple. We had this big gap up. So somebody came out with a piece of news on December 13th that was positive for Apple. And then what did it do? It cratered for one, two, three, four, five, six days straight. It moved down from that announcement from where it opened to where it closed over that six period, six day period, 12.11% off of good news, right? So that is a good example of who's moving the market. Retail traders jumped on and bought that news and were left holding the bag as institutions were like, hey, we needed a patsy. Let's, let's create a buyer, issue a nice headline. So to me, that's that's just the nature of markets. That's why I just try to, I, I, like Robert says, trust the charts. And even charts can lie sometimes, right? Especially in the short term. Uh, that's why I always like to start with the dailies. I love the daily charts. Isn't that a song? I love the daily charts. I think retail traders like us are a tiny portion, um, but there are firms, prop firms that hunt our stops. Yeah. Um, generally, most people do put their stops around round numbers. I, I don't do that anymore. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's the easiest one to figure out is whole number of stops, right? What it's, what's more important would be to use it around, you know, strong qualified demand zones. But now people, are, I think, are getting wise to that too and saying, hey, here's a demand zone. They're probably going to put their stops right here. Let's just, let's whisk them out. And, and unfortunately it happens. So <sighs> nature of the beast, all those damn prop firms hunting our stops. <laughs> uh, let's see, how much time do I got left? Okay, I got a little bit of time left. So here's another uh, interesting question from Scott. Is a wash sale the same as a wash trade? Uh, no, they are absolutely very, 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 very different things. If we look at, does anyone use the 120? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've looked at it before. Generally, what I will look at is a four and a one. So a four hour and a one hour, but I don't go to the two hour. But just a matter of personal preference there. You know, whatever you find patterns and shapes or the charts read the best to you, that's what's important. So to get to this question from Scott, a wash sale is generally a term that's used in the financial markets where if you sell a position for a loss, so let's say you had a loss on Apple because it's down 12% in three days after a firm told you to buy it and you sell it, you can't buy Apple again um, for 30 days and claim that you can't claim a loss if you buy Apple again and, and trade it within 30 days. And it's a tax thing. So, you know, if you're trading something actively, you want to be a, a pattern day trader or be a trader in status so the wash sale rule doesn't apply to you. If you are trading the same symbol very frequently, uh, be careful. That could really impact you on your taxes. That's a wash sale. 
a wash trade is very different. It's really used more in the crypto world. And what they mean by a wash trade is where people will manipulate the markets themselves. They'll be buying their own token. So I may, let's say I'm starting off a new project and it's called the Merlin token, right? Uh, Trader Merlin to token. What I'll do is I will buy Trader Merlin from a liquidity pool that I create. So I create a pool of liquidity, liquidity and I buy from there and then I sell right back. And so I start making a bunch of transactions to, per, to give the illusion of liquidity. Then what I can do is since I know the liquidity pool, since I created it, I'll just start buying out of that liquidity pool. And what that does, it drives the price of the Trader Merlin token up. And I can just buy every day, you know, buy $10,000 worth. And after five, six days, that liquidity pool is going to get so small that the price of Trader Merlin tokens through the roof, which now makes it on a bunch of watch lists. And a lot of people are like, hey, it's moving. And then they go and buy it. Wash trading is generally in crypto a term that's used for someone who's manipulating their own currency or, or their own um, project. Um, wash sales have been a really, I guess, the, the, the backbone of NFTs. And I've mentioned this to you guys before. I mean, I could, I could take a picture here and here is the Merlin NFT. Oh, great. I threw my, I threw my, uh, I threw the spring across the room and I have no, I can't write it with my pen. But if I draw this picture right here, right? There's my NFT. Got a nice little, nice little smiley face for you. That's my NFT. This is worth nothing. It's, it's worth nothing. This is literally is worth, absolutely is nothing. It's not even worth a penny. However, if, uh, <laughs> no, no, you mean SBF. Yeah, no, no, I won't do that. But what I can do here, check this out real quickly, just so you guys can have a, a visual perspective of what this is. I go out to here to OpenSea. So OpenSea.io is one of the larger NFT websites where you can, you know, buy and sell NFTs. And here's a whole bunch of stupid collections, little pudgies and timeless characters. <coughs> Excuse me. But I found one out here and went Trader Merlin. All right? There's nothing there because I don't have one. But let's say I went to Trader Merlin and I saw this NFT there and I said, ooh, I want to buy it. Well, it's worth nothing. So how do I create value? Here's what I do. I take this. I put it on OpenSea and it's worth nothing. And let's say I have a million dollars in cash. What I will do is I will post this on OpenSea. It's an NFT, so it's all digital. And I buy it from myself for a million dollars. So now this piece of artwork, which was worth zero, is now worth a million dollars. How do I know? Well, I can look at the track record and say, hey, this thing sold for a million dollars. Now what I'll do, and think about what I have now. I now have an asset that is an NFT worth a million dollars because I, it's listed on, on, on OpenSea as a million dollars, but I also paid myself. So I've pretty much doubled my value. I had a million dollars in cash and a worthless piece of paper. I bought the worthless piece of paper with my million dollars and because I'm paying myself because it's my art, I now have a million dollars again, less commissions. So now I have $2 million. That's wash trading. And this is something that really has happened uh, a lot in the NFT space where people were artificially propping up their prices and creating this feeding frenzy. That's a wash trade. So very different wash sale versus wash trade. Wash trade is outright manipulation. The wash sale is a tax issue. I think that's what we had here. Um, Bob said, um, Ganesh, can you identify the next big stock at its early stage using charts or do you need fundamental analysis? Um, I would contend that you probably need to have fundamental analysis there. Like, I think if you're going to look at the next big thing, you really want to be looking at what are they doing, right? Because if it already has a really strong trend, um, I mean, I think you can find strong companies that start early on, but I think you're you're looking for the fundamentals, right? That's what Larry was doing. I mean, he had a great call the other day. Uh, what was that one? Was, was it NTES? Remember Larry was on the show, was it last week? I'm losing track of time, guys. N-T-E-S, I think it was last week. Um, yeah, here's his n -tess. I mean, heck of a move since he was on the program. Was it 72 bucks, now we're up at 82? Oh, heck of a gain there. Nice call, Larry. Uh, he's got a couple other ones. I think he wants, um, what's another one? I thought, no, it was Copart, uh, not ConocoPhillips. It was C Copart, Copart, but anyway. Um, yeah, I, I don't usually look for those types of things. The only thing Ganesh right now that I'm looking for that it's in its infancy that I think is going to grow to be a, the next big thing is in crypto and digital assets. That's really where my focus is for that type of investment. Um, and part of the things we did with the Crypto Investor Live program, not only this morning, but also you know on Thursday nights is doing project analysis, looking and seeing, 
is this a viable company? What are they trying to do? Because many of these companies are so small and they're in such their infancy um, that the, the upside potential is absolutely enormous if they can get adopted. So that's where I'm looking. I don't look at the equity markets anymore as a as a mechanism to find the next great thing. I'm more of a trader in the in the equity markets. So. Diddly squat. <laughs> No, no, I am definitely have no interest in being a, a Sam Bankman Freed. Absolutely not. The first real NFT ever minted. Take my money. No, no. I don't, it's, I don't see the point in an NFT. Uh, it's just silly to me. Except that you can't sell it to anyone if it's really worth nothing. Well, see, that's the thing, Liz, is a wash trade is where they're actually making people believe that this has value. So let's say that we've got four or five of us as a group. So I'm going to take the last five names. Skilled Stocksman, GD, Liz, Frank, and myself. Five. All have a million dollars, right? So what we can, I can post it. We make up garbage. Just scribble on napkins and put them on OpenSea and sell those. So skilled stocksman comes in. He buys the first time that we post it. And then he immediately lists it again for sale. And then GD buys the same thing. But we all know that we're doing this. We're trying to create the illusion that there's so much demand for these NFTs. You know, when you look at some of them, let me show you one here that you're going to be like, are you kidding me? How many of you guys know Gary Vaynerchuk? I think it's called VFriends. Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, you know, just a really loud, outspoken guy, Mr. Motivation. If you look at the Gary V friends, you're going to be like, this is some of the dumbest stuff I've ever seen. Oh, these are actually brand new. Oh, these look way better. Wow. Um, these are the new batch. He used to have a batch that look, oh, Series 2. Let's see if there's a Series 1. Um, let's go V friends. You guys are going to laugh. So these ones look kind of cool. Cool little arcade looking artwork. Watch these ones. There it is. <laughs> I mean, this is something that your kids drew and you took the picture and put it on the refrigerator. Oh, look, you drew a bug. This is going for 5.79 Ethereum. That's $7,000 for this idiotic picture of a cockroach. Um, unbelievable in my opinion. And some of these, like literally, I draw better than this. Like, I'm pretty sure I could beat your armadillo here, buddy. This is the articulate armadillo. That's 8100 bucks. I mean, some of them are just out, outrageous. <coughs> the walrus, the woke raw. I mean, come on, man. People are buying this crap. And wash trades. Ooh, the persuasive pigeon. That's what I'm talking about. The persuasive pigeon. Only $9,300. I'd rather go buy a car or at least a nice down payment. I mean, nine grand gets me an epic, legendary vacation in, in Thailand for about six months on nine grand. But no, you can have a picture of a pigeon that someone drew with a Sharpie. I don't know. Sometimes I just, the stupidity of what goes on in crypto blows my mind. That said, there's a lot of amazing things going on. So anyway, that was the whole wash trade set up there. Scott, thank you for that question. And I'm going to do, um, I'll do one more and then I got to wrap things up here because I got fire beware. Yep. And, and you know, the problem is it's not just with uh, crypto and NFTs. It's also with stocks is that FOMO, that fear of missing out, right? When you, you want to be a part of the next big run. And that's what was created with the NFT space. I, I did not buy any NFTs. Actually, I take that back. I'd be lying if I said that. Um, there's a game called Star Atlas that the you have to buy NFTs, but the NFTs are food uh, for your crew, gas for your ships, and repair kits. So they're really small price. But those NFTs become part of the game. Um, I don't know if that's, that's kind of cool. That's a different, different way of using NFTs. And I think what we'll have in the near future is an evolution of how we use a non-fungible token. They will be integral in our, in our daily way of doing lives. I think it'll absolutely be ingrained in the way we do things. So let me do one last little quick question here for Landis in Singapore. Um, yeah, wouldn't it be nice if it was the Ethiopian bear? No, unfortunately, that's Ethereum, buddy. Landis says, what are a few reports that can somewhat summarize Fed liquidity levels? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by Fed liquidity levels, but you know, the easiest thing to do is simply go out to the Fed's website. Um, you have a lot of data and, and resources out there, especially if you go to Fred. Um, here is, let's go over here. So you know, if you're looking at liquidity, generally that means their balance sheet. So you can go out there and see their assets, their liabilities. You know, when I look at pictures like this, this is a very interesting picture. And I know most aren't going to look at this and understand, but this is the assets on the Fed's balance sheets. Now, back here in, you know, April of last year, we were right around, let's call it $9 trillion on their balance sheet. And now we're at 8.5. So $400 billion, almost $500 billion worth of assets have been sold in the open market. Now, what assets are we talking about here? Well, for most of that, that's the 10-year, right? So let's go up here to the bond section of my watch list. Go to that 10-year. 
So here you have, you know, the 10 year, uh, you go back in April of last year, March, April, where do we really see the, the bond market take off? Back when the Fed started, Fed peaked and started unwinding their balance sheet was back here, March and April, that's when they made the announcement, you know, that the 10 year was at 1.7. We reached all the way up here to 4.3. So that little arc that you see there curving over on this Fed's balance sheet had a very large role in pushing the yields up because they're flooding the market with with bonds that nobody wants therefore you have to offer a higher yield and if this continues i mean could you guys imagine if you look at this chart right here we've only seen a you know call it 500 billion dollars uh reduction in the balance sheet could you imagine what our markets or the yield would look like if all of a sudden they kept selling and we found they went all the way down to four trillion on their balance sheet they cut it in half if they sold that many bonds then this yield is going to be like 10 12 percent they're going to be off the charts. I mean, look, Scott McCormick picked on November 1st. He said 7% is his target. And I think that's a very real reality if the Fed keeps selling. So anyway, um, I don't have any specific reports, Landis, but you can always go to the, uh, the Federal Reserve Board. That's one. You can also go to, um, I believe it's just called FRED, the Federal Reserve as well of St. Louis. This has an epic amount of charts and graphics. I mean, honestly, if you want to look at anything released by the Fed, this is the place to go. I, I actually spend a lot of time here looking at price charts. And um, as far as looking at that data that you asked there, which is something that summarizes, not really a summary, but you can look at all the different liquidity levels. They're fairly transparent. I won't say totally transparent, um, but all the data that you could ever want with regards to the Fed it can be found there at FRED, which is uh, fred.stlouisfed.org. Um, all right, let me wrap up here. Ganesh, um, are my stop losses when I enter a trade visible to others? I see most of the time my stop loss is triggered and then go to the right direction. Yeah. So it depends on which firm you, you keep your orders at and every one of them is gonna be different. A lot of them sell their order flow to somebody else. So sale of order flow is a big factor, uh, specifically with companies like Robinhood, and, but a lot of them are selling the order flow to another party. If that's the case, then that third party has total visibility of your trades. A lot of the, <coughs> excuse me, Companies like Robinhood, to my understanding, they're not actually trading. They're not doing any trading. So even though they could see your stops, there's nothing useful for them at all. Uh, some firms can. Um, I believe Interactive Broker can, and Fidelity does have Trade Desk as well, so they probably can see your orders. Let's be honest, for the most part, they're not going to try to move a market, you know, by 20 or 30 cents to take out someone's 100 shares of a stock, right? So we don't need to worry too much about that. But if there's an overabundance of orders at a specific level, then they may try to take those out. Okay, let me uh, wrap up here because I have a phone call I got to take. Um, as far as economic calendar, this is what we've got cooking for tomorrow. There is some big news happening. It's the final day of the week, which means we do get the last big blast of unemployment data, or at least jobs data, you can see in the middle there at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, one hour before the market's open, you have your unemployment rate coming out, non-farm employment change as well, uh, that's different than the ADP, average hourly earnings, and then you also have uh, unemployment and employment data coming out for Canada at the same time. 2 a.m., you have retail sales coming out for Europe. They're expecting a nice about face there. Maybe that's the holiday season coming home to roost. And then you can see as the markets are open at 7 a.m., 30 minutes into the trading session, factory orders, ISM services, PMI data as well for the U.S. markets. And there really isn't anything there noteworthy on the uh, earnings front for tomorrow. So that will do it for today. Tomorrow is Friday. It'll be our first official glass of whiskey for the year. So I will uh, be doing a show tomorrow. If you guys have anything specific you want me to cover, put them down below the YouTube videos, pick a video, just say, hey, I want you to cover this on the show. I'll put it in the slides and if I have some time, we'll get to it. So hopefully you guys, um, mm, I don't know. I'm not sure, GD. I'll have to look at that one. I didn't think there was a holiday this Monday, but I'm pretty sure there's not. But um, If you guys uh, like the show, I know we got some new people here. So for the newbies out there, hit that subscribe button so I can uh, you know, grow my subscriber base, share it and get more people over here. The more interactivity I get, the better it is. So thank you guys so much. Uh, for participating in today's show. A lot of great comments out there. I will see you guys tomorrow with a nice glass of whiskey going over whatever topics you like. You can email me at tradermerlin at gmail as well. Take care, everybody. I will see you tomorrow.